Hello everybody, I'm really happy to welcome you here to the 2023 annual Sweet Potato Field Day. My name is Craig Yencho and I lead the Sweet Potato and Potato Breeding and Genetics Projects here at NC State. And today it's my great pleasure to introduce to you some of my teammates who are going to go through various aspects of what we're doing in research on sweet potatoes right now. From my left to right would be Ken Pakoda, who is a senior research scholar, leads the field breeding program of our sweet potato breeding program. To his left is uh, Russell Myrop, who is a research specialist working with our team, is uh, helping us to manage our field activities. And Russell's also become much of our data management guru in the program over the years. Uh, and then to his left is Simon Frere, is a PhD graduate student working with our team also, working on developing markers associated with resistance to guava root knot nematode and southern root knot nematode. And then on the far side would be Dr. Bonnie Aloka, who is a research scholar with the program, is helping to lead our genomic assisted breeding program here at the university. And for today's trial, what I'd like to do is I'm going to turn over uh, all the narration, if you will, or the descriptions of the trial first to Ken, who's going to talk about our National Sweet Potato Collaborators trial activity. It's very on the ground applied research that's being done. Russell's going to help him kind of do that, show that trial off just a bit. Then Simon is going to talk briefly about his marker assisted breeding work that he's doing for his PhD. And then Bonnie's going to hit cleanup for us, if you will, on our genomic selection studies, which are advanced breeding studies that we're engaged in here at NC State to help drive the breeding program forward. Hope you enjoy your day here today at the Horticultural Crops Research Station in uh, Clinton. Thank you. What I want to walk through today is our 2023 National Sweet Potato Collaborators Group. There's about 10 of these all over the country, and this is our version of it. And so we have some interesting things in here. We have some orange flesh, a couple of purples, and some yellow flesh materials that are coming along that I just want to introduce to you very briefly since we haven't got a lot of time. I want to start here with our two check lines, which is Beauregard and Covington, which make up much of the orange flesh industry. Um, very similar in terms of overall appearance and marketing. Uh, very good packages for disease and insect or disease resistance and uh, big horticultural uh, performance for, for yields. And they also both ship very well. So really, these are the standards that most of our growers will know. These were, this trial's got 110 days on it. Uh, standard orange flesh, sort of orange rose skin. Uh, this is what we're trying to beat. This is the one that we want to make improvements to. So that's our, our standard that we're trying to beat here. Uh, one of the newer lines in the trial is actually a Louisiana line, L18100. Uh, Don Levante is the breeder. He's considering releasing this one. It's looked pretty good in this trial. Um, it's uh, early, so if you're looking at an early variety, this one has some potential. Um, the disease package has looked good in his. It, it had a little bit of trouble in our Fusarium wilt trial, so we want to retest it and make sure that is on par with what you guys are expecting for disease resistance. But it's looked good in his trials, it's looked good in our trials. This is a very possible release at the end of this year. He's collecting a little bit more data on that. So it's looked good so far here as well. Nice classic orange flesh sweet type. The next one is a, uh, one of our lines that has performed very well the last couple of years. Um, a little bit longer, quite a bit longer than Covington and the plants are earlier than Covington. So this would be a potential very good early season fit for us. The yields have been very high. Um, this is old stock, so it's holding up very well. We now have clean stock. We'll be going into that. Orange flesh moist did very well in the bake trials. It's more of that longer but straight type shape. So quite a good contrast from, from uh, Covington, but much more consistent than we typically see with Beauregard for shapes. So we're very excited about this one. It also had a little trouble in our fusarium trials, so we've sort of pulled back a little bit to, to give it another screening and make sure that it's okay. It's been mixed results there. The next one we have is uh, 17452, a really very consistent set and sizing. So it, it can, you can, it, with quite a few roots, so that you can leave it in there for 120 days and have very little jumbo. So we can get the total yield up very high. It's a high yielding one anyway. So far, it's had a good disease package for, for Streptomyces and Fusarium. Does not have nematode resistance, uh, but the consistency has been really good and it stores quite well as 
also. So this is a long-term storage variety that could run through the season. Could be a mid-season one that would give you high yields and long storage capacity. And then as another check, uh, this is also uh, is Orleans. This has been taking over a lot of the market uh, in some of the southeastern, uh, the south states in Louisiana and Mississippi. Very similar to Beauregard, um, almost exactly in terms of uh, its profile. Okay, um, now I want to show you a couple of purples. We have actually released two of these as varieties. This one is Purple Majesty. And we have also Purple Splendor. These are actually available for licensing. So if you're interested, contact either myself or, or Craig Encho in the program. They all have slightly different um, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, Majesty actually has a really great nutritional package. There's actually some beta carotene in there as well. So we have the antioxidants with the uh, anthocyanins plus the beta carotene. So it's a real nutritional package. It's a little bit moister and sweeter than some of the other purples that are out there. And horticulturally, Russell, it's been one of our favorites, I think, for quite some time. Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic plant. It makes good, strong plants. It's, it's almost a joy to cut. <laughs> and, uh, so so that, that sky is available. Um, this is sort of uh, our next generation purple. What we're trying to do is we've maybe went too far and we've, we've gotten to the point where our, our purples bake up almost black, so a little bit darker, which is great for nutritional purposes, but a little off-putting sometimes for uh, visual. So we've gone to a lighter skinned one here. So a little lighter skin on this one compared to the Purple Majesty. And when you bake it, it bakes up a little bit lighter and uh, it's got a nice, nice skin finish is something that I always like about this clone. It has some pop when you clean it up. So it it, it's got a, a, a visual appearance on a supermarket shelf that we think is gonna be a real advantage with this guy here. Um, and it's done well in our bake trials. This is one of those that a lot of the purples can be very polarizing. People either love them or they absolutely hate them. This one was much more, there's very few people who really hated this one. It's, it's, it's a nice neutral kind of a flavor profile in it. And then the third one would be one over here, this is Purple Splendor. Uh, also another high yielding one. In fact, it's in between all of the plots here. We use it as a marker plant as well. Um, it tends to be a little shorter and rounder. Um, but extremely good plant producer, plants early. So this is one that you can get out first thing in the spring uh, and it's performed very well for us as well. So this is another very good option uh, for the purple market. It's, it's been released, it's available for licensing. So that's the purples. What I wanna do now is shift over. We have a couple of interesting uh, yellow fleshed ones. We don't actively really breed for yellow fleshed, but in crossing purples and oranges, we get these for free and some of them actually look really good. So I wanna show you a couple of those here. The first one is uh, 17, 799. And for those of you who remember the old Japanese, this has flavor profile very similar to that. Dry, sweet, good hoard package. It has a relatively low set and it'll size up earlier than Murasaki. This would be a Murasaki 29 competitor or potential replacement. So very good characteristic for Asian markets in this sweet potato variety here. This one's in uh, advanced trialing stage. We have clean stock for next year. So we're, we'll be pushing this one again next year. And then the last one I wanna talk about is uh, 15, 728. This is a true yellow yellow. And in, in our talks with some of the folks with the EU, they said, hey, we've saturated the orange market. We need something new. We want new colors. So they're very interested in yellows. And this has a really creamy, rich texture, rich flavor, not some of the flavor elements that can be off-putting in the oranges for some people. So people who like potatoes, but don't like sweet potatoes, like these types of sweet potatoes. And this is a really good shaped, good yielding version of, of that. For comparison, this is Bonita, which would be the standard sort of white, white. It, it may go straight up against it, but it may also fit slightly a different uh, market with, with yellow versus white on color. So that's just kind of a quick overview of the, of the new varieties that are coming out. Uh, if you have any questions, again, contact me or Craig and, and we can give you some more detail on this. Hi there, my name is Simon Freyer. I'm a PhD student in the Sweet Potato and Potato Breeding and Genetics program at NC State University. And this here is my colleague. My name is Boni Oloka. I work as a research scholar in the same uh, program. And today we're gonna to be talking about our work in developing marker-assisted selection for the guava and southern root-knot nematode in sweet potato. 
Uh, we'll be talking about this card here, which shows our four different major diseases in sweet potato in the southeast. Guava will be the first, southern root knot nematode the second, followed by fusarium wilt and streptomyces soil rot. The first line we want to talk about today is Juul. This is an older variety that was replaced by Beauregard. Um, and Beauregard was later replaced by Covington. The reason Juul was replaced, uh, Beauregard is a little bit less groovy than Juul, but the major reason is Beauregard had Streptomyces soil rot resistance. Covington replaced Beauregard because it followed up with uh, Meloidogyne incognita or southern root knot nematode resistance. And we've made a lot of breeding progress since Juul. Here's a line called L1431. It's from Louisiana State University. And the reason this line is important for us today is because it is resistant to the guava root knot nematode. That's a pretty rare trait in sweet potato, and it's been difficult for us to find, which is why we're working with other breeding programs to incorporate this trait into our breeding germplasm. You'll notice L1431 has red skin, which is somewhat unmarketable here in North Carolina. Um, and it also tends to be a little bit taily on the ends. Uh, show them the end there, Bonnie. The next line is our latest release at the NCSU breeding program. This is called Monaco, named after Tom Monaco. Um, this line is a little bit more marketable here, a lighter skin color, but you'll notice uh, on our card here, um, it lacks guava root knot nematode resistance, while L1431 has that resistance. As part of my graduate research, I made a biparental cross between these two lines, Monaco by L1431, and we found that a number of the progeny segregate for resistance to both guava and southern root knot nematodes, and I'll show you those next. Here's a line that we're particularly excited about. It's more of a Murasaki 29 type sweet potato, so a cream flesh with red skin. This is not a major table stock variety necessarily, but you'll notice it has resistance to all four of those major diseases we talked about. It may not necessarily be the next Murasaki, but it could certainly be the next major breeding parent, especially in the context of guava root knot nematode resistance. This next line is ML465, again a progeny of the Monaco by L1431 cross. And this too has guava root knot nematode resistance, in addition to southern root knot nematode and fusarium wilt. One thing to watch out for, this lacks streptomyces resistance. And so we take one step forward in breeding for guava, but we need to then use these as parents with streptomyces resistant parents as well. Our next line is a little bit of a resurrection. It's an older line from 2009 called NC091105. This line, uh, as part of the ML population, I developed molecular markers that informed us about historic germplasm, and we were able to find markers for resistance in this line, which we didn't know was resistant before. And that resistance is to both guava and southern root knot nematode. And it just so happens our historic data supports that it's resistant to fusarium and streptomyces as well. This is a pretty good tasting potato, and while we know that it doesn't store particularly well, it might be uh, a really good thing for growers to use to fit that uh, Thanksgiving to Christmas period. So not a long-term storage line, and also it has a lot of potential as a breeding parent for resistance to all four of these traits. And lastly, <clears throat> I'd like to show two new lines that we have. Um, the first is NC20-0333. This is not a line we know very much about but the markers that I developed with Bonnie on uh, guava and southern root knot nematode support that this is resistant. So we'll follow up by testing it in the field as well as in greenhouse for resistance to these two nematodes as well as our other diseases of interest. And we, we are aware that this one does have moderate resistance to fusarium, but we're not sure yet about streptomyces. And this last line is NC210270. So this is uh, from the year 2021. We've been really working hard at incorporating guava resistance, and we have a pretty good result to show. If you could see this a little bit closer, you would see that some of these roots are beginning to sprout. That's a little bit unfortunate, but we can work around these traits by crossing with lines that don't sprout so much. We do know that this one has guava root knot nematode resistance. It is our hope that some of these lines that we've presented today will in the future, maybe the next two or three years, end up in one of these collaborators yield trials around the country. And with that, I'll transition to Dr. Bonnie Aloka to talk about genomic selection. One of the greatest things that breeders struggle with is to identify parents parents to use for making crosses. 
That decision is made after several years of trialing and in several different environments, which costs time and money. One of the things that we use to reduce that is to use genomic selection. We throw thousands of markers in the breeding population that we have, and then we identify clones that have the highest breeding values. Breeding values, those are the numbers that you want to see in your progeny when you use that clone as a parent. So half of your progeny will perform according to the value that you have predicted for that particular clone. That is what we use markers for, and we are able to do that now in sweet potato just recently. We were not able to do that previously because we did not have the genomic tools necessary. But now, in this program, together with several other partners that we, ha we have, we have developed the tools that are necessary to bring g genomic selection into use in sweet potato breeding. Raw crops are already using, using this, but now it is the first time that we are doing this in sweet potato. Because now we have a map uh, for sweet potato, we have sequenced the genome and several other tools that we have developed, which we are using to move breeding forward. Thank you. If you have any questions about anything that we have talked about today, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you.